And now you may be seated. Thank you. So our theme, our theme for the month, because you always have a theme for the month, those of you who don't know, uh, it's been Romans 12, 3. And we also have a theme for the week, which is, uh, I'll read it for you also, but we'll start with Romans 12, 3. But first, I just want to say, great to see all those who are here today, this morning, looking across the crowd and seeing so many faces, whether it's your home church, you're visiting, or it's your summer church. We're glad to have you all here. Amen. Amen. Um, so Romans 12, 3, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's our theme for the month, and you'll see this playing out more throughout the uh, sermons as we go. This week, we're taking this from Ephesians 6, verse 4. Ephesians 6, verse 4, I'll tell you that next week is going to be, I think, Ephesians 6, verse 3, where it says, Honor your father and your mother. This one is 6, 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, nurture really has to do with the whole training and education of children, including the cultivation of their minds and their morals, their character, and, and the life. And like we nurture with food to create a healthy body, we nurture with the Word of God, and the wisdom, the knowledge of God to create a healthy soul. So our focus for the, the month is our youth and families. And today's message is to the youth, specifically to the youth, but not that it's not for everybody else. So I, I hope that you find it skippity. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Abby, for that uh, lead in there. Appreciate it. Hope you find it skippity. Uh, I don't know about dope. I don't know about that one. I don't know if I can say that one. Uh, we used to say the bomb, uh, it was bad, fire. Yeah, it was, you know, fire, yeah, all these things, all these different phrases, and, uh, and great. I think it was the other one I, I missed, the other second one, the, uh, it was groovy, skippity, but there was before skippity, there was, no, no, before, yeah, all right, yeah, I can't remember, yeah, yeah, all right, you guys get the idea. So anyway. We hope, to, we hope to offer some nursing words that will encourage you on your walk with God, prepare you as get ready to go back to school, which, of course, we know is not far away. Uh, you're all excited about that, I can tell. And uh, for the years ahead, for the years ahead. So let's uh, oh, join me as we have it. one more prayer here, at least. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, and we ask you, God, to, la to lead and bless and to move and have your way within this service today as always. Lord, we always look to you and lean to you and put our faith and trust in you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, the church said, amen. amen. So I, I did a little inquiring. You know, you want to talk to the youth. You want to find out what's going on with the youth. What, what do they, they face these days? What are some of the challenges that they have? And to my surprise, they basically struggle with the same thing that we all struggled with when we were all teenagers and we were all going through this type, time in our life when we were young Christians, that desire to, to fit in and be accepted among your peers. Okay, something that we all, we all face, and we all still face, but so much so when you're in that, that formative time in your life. So in this day, with everything so polarized as it is, it's hard to really talk about anything. You go out into school, you try to strike up a conversation, it's like one thing is political, the other thing is political, whatever it is. You used to be able to talk about the weather, you know, it was pretty much a safe zone. Hey, how's the weather? But now I can't even talk about the weather, you know, with all this talk about climate change and geoengineering and it's, everything's political everything's political right so it's hard to say anything but you know that's that's kind of the struggle no safe ground anymore and uh the world is increasingly opposed to christianity itself and and, and i so i want to say i understand you know it's like you say well you don't know what it's like today well i i do see it i don't know what it's like for you at your age i know what it was like for my age and i can just try to imagine what it'd be like for you in this day and age, in your age. So I know that the, the, the struggle can be real. I personally witnessed the challenge living our faith poses to every believer, and regardless of age. So I want to talk, though, about the cost of fitting in. Okay? Romans 12, 1 and 2 is where I'll begin. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is one of those great verses to write down and memorize. It's something that can guide you as you're going through life. Um, one of those they call wallet verses. You write it down, you stick it in your wallet, and every now and then you pull it out and you kind of read over it and kind of make sure you memorize it. it. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And we'll go to verse 2 in a moment, but I want to point out that the word present your bodies is also the same word as yield. As in Romans 6, same author, same audience, Paul writing to the Romans in Romans 6, says 13 and 14, says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, so don't present them or don't yield them, but yield yourselves unto God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. As those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So we're already presented with this, this oxymoron, if you will, this living sacrifice. How can you both be living and a sacrifice at the same time? But what it's talking about is that daily worship of God through our actions and our choices to put him and his word first in every aspect of our life. So when he's saying daily sacrifice, that's what he's talking about. He says it is your reasonable service. And again, we can do a little word study on it some other time, but it basically means it's your logical worship. Like if you were to make a conclusion of what you should assume or, or conclude based on all the facts that God's showing us about what a living sacrifice is, it is your logical conclusion to say that worship is the daily living for God day in, day out. Um, worshiping God is, is what he desires most. And, and what he desires most in worship isn't just coming to church, having some songs, shaking hands, you know, that kind of thing, and going back out. What he really desires is that daily service. And so he continues to verse 2, Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I really like that verse. I'll read it again. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of God. So this idea of service being worship is expressed in the Bible in many, many, many places. I'll give you just one more. Hebrews 12, 28 tells us the same thing. <clears throat> you can just use it as comparison. It says, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So, Worship God, again, it's more than just coming to church. We, we only really worship God if we serve him day to day. Okay? So let's, let's see here. The Bible is talk, setting up this contrast in verse 2 of chapter 12, Romans. It's talking about transformation and conforming. So conforming and transforming. To conform comes from the word metamorpho in the Greek. Metamorpho sounds a little bit like metamorphosis, right? Because that's exactly where we get the word metamorphosis. Conform. It's a little bit different, but it's syschematizo, syschematizo. <clears throat> but you look at it, it's from two words, sin, and it's like a synonym, okay, things that are alike or similar, and schematizo, schematizo is from where we get the word schema or schematic. It's a framework. You ever hear about baby schema? Baby schema? You don't know the phrase baby schema? Oh, you got to know baby schema, I'm sorry. Um, Baby schema, your babies, they have a specific layout of their, their, their faces, a specific arrangement that makes them instantly cute. You can't help it. You look at a baby and you're like, oh, that baby's so cute. Why is it? Well, the eyes are lower, they're more around the center of the, eye, of the head. The eyes are really big. They got that the small jawline and everything. It's, it's called baby schema. Hey, that's why you, that's why you love babies, okay? God did that. He did that. He did that for a reason. He did that because if he knew that if he didn't make keep babies cute, we'd want to... Anyway, uh, so... The contrast created is one, you have on one hand, you have transformation, which comes from the inside. So to be transformed, something that comes from the inside, so that we become what we were created to be, okay? So we, we become what we were already created to be. The, the metamorphosis uh, ideal picture is the caterpillar metamorphosis goes into a butterfly, right? So he was already destined to be that butterfly, he goes to the, to the process and he becomes a butterfly. So it's from within that he transforms. But on the other hand, you have conformity. Conformity comes from an external force that causes us to appear to be like something that we are not. Okay, one, you're transforming into something that you're already destined to be. The other, you have an external force causing you to appear to be something that you are not. It could be like a human, a person, behaving like an animal. That would be a good example. Um, we can alter our external appearance and mimic our behavior 
And we can do so, so much so that we can scarcely recognize who we were really created to be. And this is a problem. Imagine that. It all starts with a little conformity. <clears throat> starts on a small scale and just continues to grow. Conformity comes in many forms, in many degrees. <clears throat> we are influenced by external forces all the time, right? Most of it is harmless. Um, you could probably pick uh, countless examples of it, but the other day, a family visited our home with their teenage son, and he was wearing over-the-ear headphones. You ever seen those, like, Beats by Dre kind of things, those big, big over-the-ear ear headphones? But he wasn't listening to anything. He had them on. He had them up here at the top. He was wearing them around, talking to everybody. He moved them down below here, and he's talking with everybody. And I realized after a while, looking at this, that headphones have become a fashion accessory. <clears throat> I, I got to admit, though, for you young folks, that it's better than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we had this, basically, a mini portable stereo that you could put up on your shoulder and walk around with it, <laughs> and we call it a boom box. Yeah, so I think you're stepping in the right direction. So a lot of these things are harmless, but not all. Satan understands that the desire to fit in and to be accepted, he understands that it's there, he understands that it's human nature, and so he exploits it. So he starts off with these little things, and he wants to kind of progress it. He understands that yesterday's progressive, progressivism is today's conservatism. You know, he's like always moving the bar a little bit over, a little bit over, a little bit over. Today's ta tattoo is tomorrow's transgender surgery, okay? Yeah. Neither choice reflects God's design for man, whether it's the small one or the big one. And neither one really reflects God's choice for man, but one certainly has greater spiritual implications than the other, Okay. It usually starts on the small end and works its way toward the big. So Satan wants to, really, his goal is to erase all boundaries, all sense of normalcy. He wants to just undo it all. God created it. I'm talking about he took chaos and he void that was there at the beginning, and he took chaos and he made order and he filled it. And so it's the devil's job to restore it back to chaos and to make it deplete. Okay, That's what he wants to do. He wants you to believe the lie that you can do whatever you want to do and be what you want because he knows if he does that, you'll abandon everything that God's given you. What he really wants is for you not to be what God made you to be. That's the end goal. The Bible says, a little foxes spoil the vine. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it's a nice little adage to remember. Little foxes start small. Instead of lies and conformity, God um, offers transformation. So instead of the one thing that the devil's putting out there, we always have what God had created us for. He created us in his image, correct? We were created in the image of God, but sin has corrupted us from that image. So we need to be reborn, metamorphosized, so that we can become the image that we were predestined to be. So Romans 8, 29. Still with Romans today, right? Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, meaning God, who God foreknew. He knew us before the beginning, before he created us. We were at the, it says, when your mother's new, womb, I knew you. He also did predestinate. He predetermined from the beginning to be conformed to the image of his son so that we might be the first more born among many brethren. So you see that word conform. It's actually not the same word as the one we read before. It comes from a different Greek, so I get to say another Greek word for you. It makes me sound like I know something, but it's you know, sim, simorphos. So morphos, again, we have the, um, the root there, morphos, from metamorphosis. So it's really more akin to transformation than it is to conforming, all right? So it's, it's more like saying we got to be, he predestined us to be metamorphosized into his image. He pre predetermined this. We should be transformed into the image of his son, his son, of course, meaning Jesus Christ, and the example, the testimony, the life he lived, he modeled for us so that we would have that to follow. So we conclude, and I don't mean we're at the end of the message yet, but we conclude that one cost of fitting in <clears throat> is to allow the external force of sin to make us into something that we are not. You think about it. Where do you really want to go? What's your goal? What's your destination? What do you want to see happen in your life? And do you think that destination, that if the devil's leading it, is going to end well? So conforming to the world actually happens naturally. It's like erosion. It's like flowing downstream. You know, there's just that wear and tear. We always have that external pressure coming down on us, and if we're not preparing for it, if we're not 
thinking about what is it, where is the source, and all this type of stuff, then we're not guarding against it. We're not putting on the armor of God. So we were, we'll, we'll follow it easily. It's like, it's like the, the natural thing to do. But the hardship comes close behind. It's easy to get there, but then you have to live with the results. So we conform when we yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness, meaning we take our bodies and all the things that God's given to us and we use them for things that are unrighteous and not God's will. <clears throat> it's like allowing another spirit to inhabit us. You know, we're, it's, we're the body and God fills the spirit with the spirit and instead of doing the things as God created us to do, we're letting something else kind of direct and lead and cause us to do the things that we, he wants us to do. It's like that puppet being guided by the puppet master. Pretty soon... Our hands are doing things that we would not do. Our mouths are saying things that we would not say. Our feet are going places that we would not go. Our eyes are looking at things that we would not look at. And that's how you know you're going down that path. When you pose for a photo, you see these uh, young gals posing for the photo? I don't have my little phone, but you take the phone and pull it there. Hang on. I need to fat, fatten these lips up a little bit. Suck on them a little bit, get the blood in there, pump them up, you know. And then, you know what I'm doing, right? Lower that, that shoulder, that neckline, increase that angle up a little bit to get that, you know, all that's done. It's like you look at photos of people all across Facebook, social media, what do you see? They're all doing the exact same thing. External, external force, you think, external force going down there? It's conforming to the pressure to be alluring. That's what it is. When you make yourself alluring, you also make, you communicate that you're accessible. Okay? I saw this thing for, for male, male models. They were saying, you know, the male models, they're posing. They go, open your mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> same thing. You know, yeah. Same thing because it communicates that you're accessible. All right? To man, we're looking at the woman doing that. It's enticing. But men want a challenge. It's the nature of men. Men want a challenge. They want to talk about what they've done. They all boast about their accomplishments. Hey, when I was a kid, you know, I did this. Or, you know, yeah, I rode in that truck. You know, I drove that thing or whatever it was. Young men, they even boast about things they never did. My kids come home all the time and they say, yeah, so-and-so said he wouldn't do that. He's, he's only 10. There's no way, you know. But they do that just to appear to be men. They're like picking themselves up. Well, that's conformity also. So, ladies, if you want to, if you give something away to a man, he will, he will never be satisfied because he didn't earn it. He knows he didn't earn it. It wasn't a challenge to him. He got it for free, so it holds little value to him. You know what's more attractive to a man? is modesty. It really is. Godliness is more attractive, and I'll explain to you why. The man has to measure up to your maturity. He does. He has to measure up to your maturity. He has to win you based on your godly values. So you set the standard and say, you meet up to this standard, then we'll talk. Okay? And he's like, man, I don't, that's, that's work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he has to come up to your, your godly values, which, which don't come without hard work and commitment. In the end, he knows he has earned your affection. He knows that you, um, you, you know that he values you because he was willing to put in the work to earn you, right. right? And that's how it works. So know the source also. We also want to know the source of this external force. It says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, does it not? Means means. He doesn't take us by surprise. We already know what he's up to. We know his scheme. Amen. He says he desires to sift you as wheat. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right. He's up to no good all the time. Satan is a force behind conformity. Since he cannot create, all he can do is mimic and pervert. For example, he perverts transformation. There's a term for, for what's going on in the world. that you look at it as a big movement. It's called transhumanism. Are you familiar with the term? All right, so you got transhumanism. When we take, it's basically like this. You take God out of the picture. If you take God out of the picture, what are we? We're simply highly evolved animals. That's it. God doesn't exist, right? So, you know, we just evolved, and because we evolved, we actually got to the point where we are so sophisticated, we have such technology, that we actually have the ability to shape our own evolution. And we can guide our direction according to our own design of where we want to be. That's the idea behind transhumanism. We're going to... Just do what we want to do to get the results that we want to get the results with because we are that smart and essentially we are our own God. So Satan is never satisfied with a little disfigurement as the word trans suggests transhumanism is not a destination. 
It's the path to a destination. The destination is post-humanism, which is where things are moving now. So you heard of post-humanism. Not as much. Transhumanism, we know. Post-humanism, that's the destination, the end result. The destination is post-humanism, the false dream that we will no longer be human. We'll have, we, uh, we'll have excelled above it. We're no longer human. Through the use of technologies such as gene editing, mRNA applications, AI, tech enhancements, you know, all these types of stuff. We become something beyond human. The new and improved, human 2.0, whatever you want to call it, post-human. We, we then have this, this, this promise to conquer all disease, ailments, enhance yourself to be able to do the things you want to do, overcome the things that you were limited to by your human nature, and eventually become immortal, escape death itself. Yes. And we'll just upload you into some, some computer and we'll fire, fire your brain out into space and you'll exist out there and communicating with all the alien beings. Out, you know, all these ideas that are out there. Okay. Like I said, you become your own God. Escaping all the things that are there that are keep us human, that keep us accountable to God. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this to judgment, right? So you have your life, you live, you die. After this, you have judgment. Well, if you can escape death, you can escape judgment. Isn't that really the, really the, the goal for everybody? They're like, we just don't want to face that judgment in the end. So transformation is contrast by conformity, once again. Transformation makes us into the actual sons and daughters of God, actually. Makes us into the sons and daughters of God. Now, isn't that the opposite of all the things that the, that the world is promising, that they can't ever deliver on? And we can actually have it. We can actually receive it if we would just yield to God and let him guide and lead us. That's really what I think we're here for. Not, not the false promises to become our own gods. Of course, we must be reminded that if we yield our members to sin, someone is always going to be the puppet master, so we never want to do that. Of course, we must be reminded also that this is as old as Satan's original temptation of Adam and Eve to become as gods. Conformity is like that ancient practice of foot binding. If you recall, they did in China for so many years, they just wrapped the foot and wrapped the foot from a child and, then, and he, the foot keeps growing with inside until it conforms to this small little distorted form and there was you know, great a deal of pain that came with it and people had disabilities for the rest of their life because of this practice. So confirmation, or conformity, sorry, leads people in pain. And since Satan is never satisfied with the amount we comply, we always, he will always demand more and more and more of us, constantly. More pressure, more pressure, conform, conform, conform. You start going down that path, you just keep going down the path, there's no end to it. And it's like that carrot on a stick, you can, ne you can never reach it. And 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19 says more about that. It says it better than I say it. It says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, right, all these promises of all the things that you can have and achieve, they allure through the lust of the flesh, right? Because we really want to escape death. We really want to escape judgment. We really want to have all the things our way. Through much wantonness, which is that lustfulness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, you know, those people who actually had made their commitment to God, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. So the same people that are telling you these things can happen, these things, they're, all, they're all enslaved to it already. How can they give you any liberty when they're already slaves? That's exactly what it's saying. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Okay? They cannot offer you freedom because they themselves are enslaved. So people may want to fit in, but they can never fit in. The more they give, the more is demanded. Eventually, they become vested in their own lie. Okay? Vested in your own lie means eventually they become their, everything about their life is just like all put into this one thing until their identity is fake, their friends are fake, their joy is fake. You know, all their success that they think they have is all fake because it's all built on that same lie. But they're so vested in what they have committed themselves to for so long, it seems like they just can't give, give it up. For years and years and years, I've been doing this, been doing this. How am I going to leave it? How can I leave it now? To lose them would be to lose everything they've put their work behind for their whole life, however they may be. What they really need, though, at this point, is someone to show them the way to transformation, how to be transformed into the image of God. That means that they need each of you. They need each of you 
not who is being conformed to the world, but those who are standing strong, who are clean escape from the corruption of the world, who are living righteously, living godly, not letting the pressures of the world sway you, as a song we read, sang this morning, uh, I shall not be moved, that you're that kind of a person, because when all these things come around and all, their life has been going down that path for so long and they realize it's at a dead end, they need you. So you may be looking at them thinking, how do I fit in? Eventually it comes back around. The Bible says that the fields are white to harvest, but the laborers are few, correct? In other words, we may feel like we're the only ones living for God and everyone else wants to live for the world. You may feel that way, but the Bible says that there are many waiting to be shown the way. In other, other words, there aren't a lack of people looking for salvation. You know, we think, we think the fields are white, or we think we go out there, we share with people, maybe you're out there at school and you feel like you're the only one and all these people are trying to tell you to do this, do that, do this, do that. But what the Bible is telling us is that there are many, many people who want what you have and you don't realize it. What we lack are the people to do the work. What we lack are the people to make that stand. That's what, we're, that's what we're lacking. You feel like you're the only one. The devil tells you you're the only one. But the Bible tells you differently. It says, look, the, the fields are white to harvest. The laborers are few. It's actually the opposite. You may feel like everybody's against you, but really, they need what you have. Amen. Amen. One of the most beautiful things you can experience in life is having God use you to bring somebody to the knowledge of the truth. It's absolutely one of the most beautiful things. I tell you, just every time I have had the opportunity to sit down with somebody and share them with the Word of God, whether it's salvation or whether it's just overcoming some obstacle and, or, or, and just, just sharing a verse in fellowship where, like, God, just like, wow, I never saw that. And, and that moment that that happens, you know God is working through you. He is in you. You feel his presence. It's tangible, it's, it's, and it's something that you can share with others around you. And it's a beautiful thing. Now, it's not that you may think, well, you know, you've, been doing this for a long time or whatever and may think that maybe you can't do that. You may feel insignificant or in, unprepared or whatever. But I will just say this. I began sharing the gospel the day I was born again. <laughs> I came out of the tank and I got on the phone and I'm like, guess what? Guess what I learned? You know, this is what the Bible says. This is how to be born again. Um, and it's not because I was anybody special. It's just that I was excited about it. I started to do it. And when I started to do it, I started to learn more and more and more. Did anybody get saved when I first got out of the water and started sharing with anybody? anybody? No, absolutely, they didn't. They said, what are you telling us? You know, we're, I was talking to my parents. We raised you. We brought you to church. We told you. You know, they totally rejected it. I mean, honestly. You know, so it's not that you, you're not always successful. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. But it's the fact that you start doing it. And when you start doing it, you learn, you learn, you learn. So God does it through you. When you see the power of God work through you like that, it will go a long way to strengthen you in your walk with God against conformity. Just because you see, wow, I, I, there really is something here. There really is something that God wants to do within my life. And that will strengthen you. That'll, that will empower you more than anything else can. So you may think the sharing the gospel isn't easy, but, you know, you think maybe it's just something that I do because, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say what you're thinking because I'm old. But, uh, you know, really, it starts somewhere. The sooner you start, the sooner you will see God use you. And you'll find that he will use you no matter what. Regardless of your experience, your knowledge, he will use you. But to help others, we first need to be transformed ourselves, right? We have to do it for ourselves. Without the Spirit of God in our lives, we will be helpless, absolutely helpless. If you haven't accepted Christ, if that's you today, that's your first step. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Accept him in his word for who he is. Accept him in salvation. The way he tells us, regardless of the way we may think, look to his word and find it there. Luke 22, 31 to 32 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Okay? Peter was one of the the apostles, one of the disciples of Christ, Simon Peter, who is who he's referring to here, followed him all of his life. And yet, even in this time, he says, the devil wants to draw you away. He's making a bid for you. Desires to have you. He says, but I prayed for you. And when you are converted, when you allow that take, change to take place, when you really start to grasp and understand, when you really let the Word of God and the Spirit of God work and move in your life, then strengthen your brethren. We have to be transformed first. Then we can 
strengthen others. So we cannot change the body, though, if we were thinking about how does this happen? How do we make this transformation? And so, again, back to Romans 12, it tells us we cannot change the body without changing the mind. Okay, you want to make the body change? The mind's got to change first. The mind is the, I like to say, the interface. Of course, it's not a scripture behind this one. <laughs> it's the interface, though, in the, uh, as you look at the application, between the spiritual and the physical. Okay, right? The mind, we're praying to God, and the mind's telling the body what to do. We have the two things happening at the same time. So it says, through the renewing of the mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. So we have to have that mind renewed. And we do that through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's the only way to transformation into God's image. So when we allow God to direct us, we look to His Word, we have fellowship with one another, we worship God together, our lives reflect the image of God. That's what happens. That's the transformation. We start to let the Word of God change us and transform us. Our marriages reflect the image of God as well through transformation because that's what's giving us. The Word of God is giving us the, the model for what marriage should be. Our families will reflect the image of God because it tells us, again, the model for what the family should be. In fact, family is one of the greatest antidotes to the pressures of the world. It's one of your safe havens if you have a godly family. And if you don't have a godly family in, in the natural, you have a godly family in the spiritual. So it's one of your safe havens. It is in our families that we gain our acceptance and our identity. <clears throat> okay? I'm going to explain this. When we create a lasting environment for the family, parents, when we create this lasting environment for our family, we, it, this becomes essential to the child. But when we conform the family to the world, this whole idea of how we raise the kids and so forth, as, as the world's putting it out there, it says family, family is, event, is a nest that you eventually throw your kids out of. <laughs> That's the way the world looks at it. You know, so I'm sorry, parents. We, uh, I know you're hoping to become empty nesters and all that. But um, now I don't mean that they should be living in your basement or anything either, but I'll explain. There are many biblical examples to draw from when looking for a proper example of a family home. I'm just going to use one. It's John 14, 2 through 3. Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So throughout the Bible, the home is described as a tent. In many, many places you'll see it, especially in the Older Testament examples and so forth. You think of a yurt. You know what a yurt is? I know one person who definitely knows what a yurt is, and that's Nazira from Kyrgyzstan. But it's this large tent, and the family would live within this large tent. It's the family yurt. How would you like to have one of those these days? You know, go get back and go, go down, and we also say that the other slang would be the home is a crib. Yeah, I'm going to go to my crib. Well, I'm going to go going back to the yurt. I don't know. I don't know. We have to work, see if we can get that one to stick. So uh, I'm not saying this just because I want to actually go on another camping trip either, though I, though I do. I'm waiting for us to do it. Organize whoever's behind organizing that. Um, when we try to picture a house with many mansions, it makes a lot of sense to us when we think about the biblical tent. Okay? A tent with many partitions. As a, as a family grows, they just keep. They get a bigger tent. They keep dividing it up into more and more partitions and everybody's in there. Or maybe they build off of it with extended partitions. This is why it says that he will receive us unto himself, right? He's gonna, Jesus says the Father's going to go and prepare a place and he's going to receive us unto himself. We're all going to be under that roof of that yurt. So I love to describe in greater detail and more about this. Maybe sometime I'll get the opportunity. I'm going to talk about the tent or that tabernacle that was on the Mount Sinai where Moses met with God canopy that came down over and he was in there and he met with God or that tent that Moses fashioned after he met God in the tent on the mountain the one that he fashioned after the image of the tent it says that God showed him or the tent that was Christ the tabernacle that he dwelt in or the tent that we are because we are the temples of God all these things but I want to draw your attention to the tent that we call the church okay the tabernacle the dwelling place of God the Christian family, our natural Christian family, and the Christian church family are communities. And they're communities that we have, inside these communities we have our identity according to God's design. That's what he gives it to us for. In our 
if our end goal is to leave home, to leave our church community, to go out, to strike it on our own, to try to discover ourselves, uh, then I think that we have failed to realize that we were never lost when we were home. We were never lost when we were with our family. Our identity has never been what we make of ourselves. You don't go out there and discover yourselves. You don't go out there and make your identity for yourself. Your identity is who you're known to be by those who know you. Your identity is found within your family. It's relational. Identity, identity is totally relational. You can't go out there and be an individual with your identity if nobody knows you. You know, look at the um, elderly people who are in like nursing homes and so forth. You get around them, what do they want to do? They want to talk about what they've done and all the things that happened and who they want to hang out with, the people who've been through the things they've been through um, because they can identify with them. They can all associate. Without, with, if you were to separate the generations and, and then have the young people go and visit the older people without any context of what they're talking about and it's sharing stories of the past and so forth, the, the, you know, you, you look at these people, you know, there's no identity. I'll give you an example. The, one, of the, one of the main instructors that taught me martial arts um, he was a well, he was a police officer in in um, in St. Louis, and he was a UN peacekeeper where he went over to Bosnia for a year or two and did peacekeeping over in that war torn area. Um, he became a police detective and saw all kinds of ac of uh, you know crime and dealt with all kinds of issues. Right, very experienced, very uh, decorated officer in the police force. And then he retired. He retired and he goes, I'll just pick up a little job. So he went to go and work security at a college campus. And they, had n they, they did not know this guy from Adam. They just thought, here's this old guy. He wasn't even that old, but here's this old guy. We're all young. He could have taken him and broke him like a stick. I mean, he, this, guy is, this guy would take nails and bend them. I mean, this guy's strong. And uh, very skilled in his martial arts. He's a grandmaster. And... Uh, they didn't know him from anybody. He says, basically, I've become a glorified jander. Everybody forgets to get their keys in the morning. I have to go and unlock their doors for their, their classrooms. And that's what it, what it turned out to be. He had, it was, his identity was totally gone. There was no connection to the people who knew him. Okay, so your identity is relational. The hand would never understand its function within the body if it weren't, wasn't attached to the body. We're all members of the body of Christ. He created us to be members of the body of Christ. We only discover our identity within the body of Christ when we're part of the body. Identity is relational. Adam had no, one, no identity before God gave him Eve. He, he's like, I'm Adam. All these animals are out there. He's looking at them. They can relate to each other. There's the male goat, the she goat, you know, the male monkey, the she monkey, whatever. They relate to each other. They can identify with each other, but he's totally alone. He's in a class of his own. He really is. None of the animals could relate to him. Why? Because they just simply weren't like him. When Adam saw Eve, he said, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He identified with her because she was like him. He said he called her Isa, which means we, say, we use that to say woman, because she was taken from man. They were relational. She gave him his identity. Think about that, ladies, when your husband's giving you a hard time. You know, if it weren't for you, you'd have no identity. But... <laughs> But it comes from our relationship to those around us. We have our identity in the family that God gives us and who knows us. So don't seek your identity out in the world. That's my tip. Stay in your family yurt. Lot, what did he do? He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He was there. He couldn't get along. His herdsmen couldn't get along. He went and pitched his tent towards Sodom, and it cost him everything, everything. He was totally vested, right? Like I said before, he put everything into that, and when it all came down as, as it was going to, he had to go, uh, hightail it out of there and leave, and he lost everything. So as I begin to close, back to Romans 12. Be transformed that you may prove the will of God. That's what it tells us to do in Romans 12. You want to be transformed? It's by the renewing of our mind, and the purpose is so that we can prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Prove comes from the word dokimazo. I don't know why I wanted to put that word in there, but I think it sounds like a Japanese word. So for all your little anime fans... Dokimazo, hey, hey. It's, but it's Greek. Greek. It often has a sense of finding out the worth of something by putting it to use or putting it to the test. You want to know if it's any good? Put it to practice. 
You may think that that driver's ed class was enough for you to be able to manage uh, I-94, but until you're out there on I-94, you just don't know. You know, when I was in high school, they used simulators. Do you still use simulators in, in high school? Probably not. When I was in high school, they, they gave us simulators. So you, you, you remember those cardboard cars we made for the uh, drive-in movie thing? Yeah, think of that, except a little bit, maybe a little bit better, you know, <laughs> a little bit better. You sit there and you have the wheel and you got the pedals and you practice, but the problem is that everybody's looking at the same screen, so the screen's just playing along and you're like pretending that you're driving, you know. <laughs> now they even have video games that are better than that. I actually played a video game against this 11-year-old and he beat me in the race. You know, he didn't know how to drive a car, but man, I guess he does because I couldn't keep up. So anyway, if we conform to the world, we will never prove God to be true. You can't prove it. You, you know, you just keep giving in. You'll never, and you make a stand, you let God come and, and stand behind you and stand with you, you'll find that he's true, he's there, he's real, his word is real, his promises are real, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. You'll never prove his love in your life. We'll never prove his will to make us into his image and that he can dwell with us. So wise choices prove themselves by their own merit. You make a wise choice, you know by the fruit it bears that it's a wise choice. That's wisdom. I, I really, I think wisdom is something we could really attach our minds to and put focus to. We'd go far. I, I like to define it as an action that bears fruit, that remains and bears more fruit. So you do something, and you go, well, that was fruitful, and that fruitful is, has, has a tenure. You know, it, has, it can last, and not only will it last, but it'll then brew, bring more fruit. You think of it just like a seed. You, you, grow, you plant a seed, and it grows tomatoes, and there you have tomatoes, and those tomatoes then bring seeds, and those seeds, you plant those, and, and they bring forth more tomatoes. So that's wisdom, God's wisdom in action right there before us. Okay? Wisdom is regenerative. It can keep going and going and going. It perpetuates fruitfulness. It's hard to see the fruit of people's actions early on. You know, you put that seed in the ground and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and nothing comes out first. But in time, time, it becomes apparent. You're young, you're trying to live right, stand the ground, so forth. Now, you may not see all that comes out of it right away. Give it time because you will. You will. Foolish things lead to failure. They lead to destruction. They lead to death. Wise things lead to success, growth, and life. I am now, you know, way past our, I don't know, maybe we're coming up on our 40th high school anniversary or something somewhere soon. Okay? Hard to imagine. I, I know. I can't believe it either. You know? You, you know, those of you who are in high school now, going back to school, you think you got all these different people doing different things. You got these kids, they're the cool kids and the nerd kids or whatever you may categorize them and so forth. But just think, where will they be? And that's why they think they probably do that. You know, who's most li likely to succeed? Who's most likely to, to end up in a, in a motor home down by the river? You know, who, who's, whoever, they have all these things in your book, all this type of thing. But it makes you stop and look and look and examine people, not just because of their popularity within school, but what are they doing now? What do you think is going to be the fruit of them in years to come? I remember the time when I was, uh, you know, growing up, we had kids and friends and so forth, even friends in church. And uh, to make a quick story, uh, one guy, Greg, older guy, but we really looked up to him, spent a lot of time with him and his family and so forth. He um, showed us one time this cooler in his garage and with a little light inside of it. And we're like, what's this? And he was growing a little plant, a special plant with five leaves on it. On and I'm like, all right, Greg, that's... We'll see you, you know, we went on our way. We didn't have much interest in it. We were pretty young, so it wasn't, it wasn't something we would think to have any interest in. But I remember seeing it. And then I went off into the Navy. And I was in the Navy, and my dad called me up. Hey, I just want to tell you, they, they found Greg. You know, he apparently was getting into drugs and did a deal, and it went bad. And, and they found him in a hotel, and, you know, he, they shot him. They shot him can't you don't know now what the, the outcome is going to be but you'll know in time and the word of god is true you can count on it and it tells you you do this you'll get this you do this you'll get this it's not like like you read through proverbs like proverbs is, isn't a guarantee you know train up a child in the way you should have him go and he'll never depart it's like it's not a guarantee it's a principle 
You do what's right, the fruit comes out of it. You do what's right, the fruit comes out of it. And that's how we want to live our lives. So in our closing thought, you were not made to fit in. You're trying to fit in, but you weren't even made to fit in. You were made to do what? You were made to stand out. Amen. John 15, 18 to 24, if we bring it home. It says, if the world hated you, no. This is Jesus speaking. It says, if the world hated you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Okay? It's a long-standing enemy way before we were born, okay? Because it's a long-standing battle that, that occurred before we were born. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You got those that, they're just not going to like what you have to say and do. You're going to point out the things that they're doing that's wrong. And they're not going to like that either. Because they're of the world. Remember, the world that I, the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So there are those who will go against you, but there are those who will hear you. Okay? You got both. You got both. Don't you want to receive those into the, to the fold, into the family who will hear you? I know you do because you're providing out your friends and your neighbors and your families. It says, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. For my name's sake. Because they know not him that sent me. He goes on 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. So we know that just like in the Old Testament law, Jesus revealed sin also in his day. He revealed that sin, as we said. Some people are going to oppose you just because you're revealing it. But now they have no cloak for their sin. You make them exposed. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If he had not done among them the works, I'm sorry, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. So Jesus came and exposed it all. It says he put down all principalities and powers. He put them to an open shame. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. So we always will have those who will oppose us. You're always going to have it no matter what you do in life. You want to be successful. There are those who want, it, want you not to be successful. I got people who come in and they want to, you know, do for my, my day job. I mentioned it on the 201, but uh, they come in, they want to be healthy, and so they want to eat right. So one, couple, one spouse comes in to eat right, goes home and starts eating right, and the other spouse is doing everything they can to get them off the, the good habits, the good food, and to make them start eating poorly again. They just don't, want, don't want them to succeed because if they succeed, they know they have to start eating right and doing things well. If they prove it can be done, they know they have to do it. You'll always have those who oppose you no matter what, whether you're living for God or you're not living for God. You might as well live for God because then you have God on your side. Amen? Amen. But behind every argument of opposition is a person opposing God. So we know that. Whenever we have this opposition, we know there's somebody fighting against God. Do you think that God doesn't care about that? Well, of course he cares about that because he's going to push against them too because he wants to bring them also to the truth. They may give you a thousand reasons why what? Abortion is good, why drugs are okay, why sex is safe, all this stuff. But behind it all is a person who simply wants to be his own God, somebody who wants to do things his own way. And this is when you can show them how God has made them to be in his image. You want to be your own God? Let me show you how to be a God. This is what the Bible says how to be a God. And I mean a real God. <laughs> and you understand what I mean when I say be a God. I mean we are the sons and daughters of God. Not, but we will live eternally. And that's what we need. That's what we want. Otherwise we're going to face the penalties of this, of this sinful life, which is death. So this is when you show them. And that God has made them, that God loves them, and he wants them to be transformed into his child. So with that, amen. I, uh, I pray that it was skippity. God bless you.